If you spend any time at all on social media, you're probably well aware of a so-called call-out or cancel culture, meaning the public shaming and often shunning of someone who's done or said something problematic. And while many feel it's a powerful tool for holding powerful people accountable, others aren't convinced, including my next guest, longtime feminist and social justice activist Loretta Ross, who's now teaching a class on the pitfalls of call-out culture. In it, as she explains in a recent profile in the New York Times, she challenges her students to call people in and discuss problems instead. Loretta Ross is also coming out with a book on the same subject called Calling In the Call-Out Culture. She was recently named one of Ms. Magazine's top feminists of 2020, alongside the likes of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Stacey Abrams, and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Loretta, it's good to see you again. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on your show. So we all know what calling out is. Uh, I'm not sure we all know what calling in is. What is it? Well, calling in is really a calling out done with love and respect. So you pay attention to the harm, but instead of putting somebody on full blast with your anger, you're just offering them the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, when you said that, I'm not sure you meant the land that way. Can we go talk about it? It's really calling attention and holding people accountable, but keeping their humanity in the front of your head. As somebody who occasionally finds calling out to be incredibly satisfying, why is calling in preferable? Oh, well, I like calling out with the best of them, but I try to punch <laughs> upwards, <laughs> really. I want to hold people accountable by calling them out who abuse their power or their authority. But at the same time, I'm not going to punch sideways of people who don't know the right, the right language or get the, my, my gender pronoun wrong or anything like that. And certainly I'm never going to punch downward on people who are more vulnerable than me who can't fight back. So I love calling out. I play dozens with the best of them, but I'm trying <laughs> to use it selectively. You know, I think you said when you joined us on the radio that for this to work, the person who would be called in has to, quote, own their stuff. So let me give you an example, the one that I broached with you first time we talked, again, if I can. You're quoted in that New York Times profile of you as saying, you know, I, I don't like it when somebody does something as a teenager and they're still held accountable for it at 55 years old. So let me pick the same example I talked to you about before. Brett Kavanaugh is 55 years old today. 50, I mean, this year, 53 years old when he's accused by Christine Blasey Ford in the Congress of sexually, assault, sexually assaulting her as a teenager. Now, if Kavanaugh, unlike denying everything belligerently, was willing to, quote, own his stuff, would it have been appropriate for Christine Blasey Ford to just have that more gentle, kinder, calling in kind of episode with, with someone like Kavanaugh? Well, it depends on when he owned his stuff. I mean, when you, you wait till you get nominated before the Supreme Court, and then yeah. you're going to admit that you did something wrong when, when there's plen been plenty of time for you to have admitted that much before then. Well, you can't make it transactional. You can't say, I'm only yeah. going to confess to this because I've got an opportunity on the line. You have to have sincere regrets and make reparation for the harm well before it becomes a transactional deal for yourself, because that's self-serving. So let's assume that, that a generic Brett Kavanaugh does own his stuff, not at that moment where it helps him, but at an appropriate moment. Where in your, your thinking does the obligation of the harm person come in to alert people beyond the person who did him or her wrong? that that wrong was perpetrated. Do you, do you know what I mean? That to well, let the I'm world know people. that there's a threat out there. See, I'm one of those people that believes that if you have bad news that you know about yourself, run and be the first one to tell it. And that mm -hmm. way you control the narrative and you can offer sincere cont contrition. But if the harm person has to be the one to tell on you, you automatically put yourself in a worse position because then the person you've harmed controls the narrative. You don't. Taking responsibility for the stupid things or the wrong thing or the, the, the problematic things we do is part of adulting. 
as you become an adult, you should be able to look your mistakes in the eye and make a commitment not to do them again. You know, about a week or so ago, I was reading about legendary civil rights leader and ally of Martin Luther King, C.T. Vivian, and I had forgotten at the time what a pivotal role he played in your life, including this the development of this kind of approach to problem solving. What role did he play? Well, in 1995, I, uh, I was working at the Center for Democratic Renewal. I'd gotten the job in 1990. And it was right after the Oklahoma City bombing. And Reverend Vivian came to the office and basically said to us that when you ask people to give up hate, then you need to be there for them when they do. And this is something he had said several times before, but somehow after Oklahoma City is sunk in, for me at least, that all of this anger, all of this rage I used to use as my fuel to fight the Ku Klux Klan and the Aryan Nations and all of the militia groups, it wasn't the pathway forward. It was about, first of all, forgiving myself so that I could find the capacity to forgive others. And Reverend Vivian made that so clear, and he said it over and over again, but I'm hard-headed, so it took several years of hearing (laughs) it for me to get it. But he was so right. He was absolutely right. So for people who are convinced that your way and Reverend Vivian's way uh, is the way to go, how hard, if not impossible, is it to follow that path in an environment like we have today where half the population is calling out the other half of the population virtually every minute and the other half is calling out the first half every other minute? Do you know what I mean? Is this in this environment, is it possible to do what you're suggesting? Oh, I don't think it's ever impossible to do what we're suggesting. I mean, think about the poor mother back in the days of the Civil War where she had one son join the Confederacy and one son son worked for the Union. I mean, this is something that human beings have to deal with. How do we deal with conflicts both in our families and our society, particularly in a democracy that's pluralistic? We need to grow up, basically. And speaking of growing up, I want to say... However mistakes were handled when you were a child, it's going to be the pattern you use as an adult. So if you weren't trained to self-forgive your mistakes and learn from them, guess what? As an adult, you're not going to be able to self-forgive your mistakes and learn from them. And so when I teach this stuff, I teach people about going back and learning and revisiting where they learned how to handle their mistakes and other people's mistakes. And really point out those times when someone offered them grace and forgiveness and see if they can replicate it for others. Loretta Ross, I'm going to try it, and I can't wait for your book. It's great to see you. Thanks. Thanks again.